This is a video on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I'll be discussing the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. As in all of these videos, the boxes are color-coded according to this legend up here. And one additional legend that we have here is the pink puffer versus blue bloater designations for the manifestations of COPD. So let's go ahead and clear all of these boxes <clears throat> and get started. We're going to start with a brief description of the pathophysiology. COPD can be caused by two big buckets of processes, chronic inflammation and tissue destruction. And we'll see that all of the pathophysiology we talk about will fit into one of these two buckets, and the manifestations will come out of them. These buckets are, of course, connected as well, so they relate to each other. Chronic inflammation leads to tissue destruction, as we'll see. And I already mentioned the two big categories for manifestations, pink puffer and blue bloater, and we'll be designating the boxes according to those manifestations as well. But first, let's talk about the etiologies. There are exogenous factors that cause COPD, as well as endogenous factors. The exogenous factors are probably the ones you think of first. These are essentially environmental toxins. So tobacco use is the most common cause in the United States. Secondhand exposure to smoke, so secondhand smoke can also cause COPD. Air pollution and fine dusts can also cause COPD. This is more common in uh, other countries outside the United States than inside the United States. Now these exogenous factors mostly cause chronic inflammation, but we'll see that tobacco use, specifically nicotine, can also stimulate tissue destruction directly. Of course, all of these can cause tissue destruction through the chronic inflammation that they cause. Essentially what's going on with these exogenous factors is that you're inhaling some kind of noxious stimuli, which increases the oxidative stress in your body and creates reactive oxygen species that then cause chronic inflammation. Next, let's look at the endogenous factors. A big factor that can cause COPD is recurrent pulmonary infections. This can happen, for instance, due to an immunodeficiency, such as IgA deficiency, where you have recurrent mucosal infections. So if you have recurrent pulmonary infections, you'll have recurrent episodes of inflammation in the lungs, and that inflammation can uh, essentially cause tissue destruction in your lungs that leads to COPD. You can also have recurrent pulmonary infection from lung development problems. So your lungs don't grow normally if they don't develop normally. They won't have the normal ciliary clearance mechanisms that helps you clear infections, and those infections can again cause inflammation and tissue destruction. Lung and growth abnormalities are um, typically following premature birth, where um, baby was born too early and the lungs were not fully developed before birth. Tuberculosis is one such pulmonary infection, so recurrent tuberculosis infections or chronic tuberculosis can also cause levels of inflammation that cause COPD. Airway responsiveness can also predispose you to chronic inflammation that causes COPD. This is maybe in line with people that have asthma. They might be predisposed to other types of airway responsiveness that can cause COPD. Lastly, there are some hereditary or genetic disorders that can cause COPD. This includes alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, as well as primary ciliary dyskinesia, also known as Kartenegger syndrome. So those can also cause COPD. That being said, let's go ahead and get into our chronic inflammation pathophysiology for COPD. It usually begins with some type of cell, some inflammatory cell, like neutrophils, macrophages, and CD8 T cells. And when you have inflammation, these inflammatory cells are going to release cytokines. Now cytokines do a lot of things in the inflammatory cascades. One of the things they do is that they stimulate the release of growth factors. Now these growth factors do many things, again, they specifically induce structural changes in the long parenchyma, and that's what we're going to see here. So one type of structural change that they induce is peribronchular, sorry, peribronchiolar fibrosis. This results in narrowing of the airway, first of all, and it also results in obliteration of some of the air spaces. This obliteration of the air spaces is the definition of emphysema, and emphysema is one of the classic terms associated with COPD. We used to kind of consider emphysema its own disease, a disease of its own, but we've now lumped emphysema and chronic bronchitis under the, the diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. When you have obliteration of the air spaces and narrowing of the airway, that they both contribute to hypoxic vasoconstriction. And hypoxic vasoconstriction, in addition to 
the growth factor release can lead to smooth muscle hyperplasia in the small airways and pulmonary vasculature. When your airways in the, in, the, in the pulmonary vasculature become very small, when you have smooth muscle hyperplasia and those airways become very tight, this leads to pulmonary hypertension. And we'll see the downstream manifestations of pulmonary hypertension later on in this video. In addition, another effect of the growth factors is that they lead to goblet cell proliferation, hypertrophy of the goblet cells, mucus hypersecretion, and impaired ciliary function. So these are all inflammatory processes that essentially lead to cell and tissue damage in the lungs. This is what leads to that chronic productive cough that you have in COPD. And again, this is the designation of chronic bronchitis. So we used to consider chronic bronchitis a distinct disease from emphysema, but we now realize that they are both kind of one and the same under the umbrella term of COPD. Some people have COPD with more emphysema pathology. Some people have COPD with more chronic bronchitis uh, pathophysiology, but there's really a combination of both. They're, they're pretty similar. They're, they're kind of along the same um, spectrum of disease. In addition, this goblet cell proliferation, mucus hypersecretion, impaired ciliary function leads to your breath sounds being abnormal on auscultation exam. So you might hear a patient have prolonged expiratory phase of respiration. They might have end expiratory wheezes. They can have crackles, muffled breath sounds, and coarse ronchi when listening to their lungs. Now let's talk about how the chronic inflammation leads to the tissue destruction in COPD. So chronic inflammation, uh, one of the effects of these growth factors and the cytokine release is that it increases the activity of proteases. Now proteases are a type of enzyme that break down protein. In addition, we said that tobacco use specifically also leads to this pathophysiology of tissue destruction. It's actually the nicotine in the tobacco that causes this. So ticotine, nicotine and other noxious stimuli, they inactivate protease inhibitors. So if you're inactivating protease inhibitors, you're essentially doing the same thing here. You're increasing the effect of proteases. When you have increased activity of proteases, one such protease is elastase. When you have increased elastase activity, increased protease activity, you're going to destroy the alveolar walls. Now this sounds familiar. This is like obliteration of the airways. So this is again emphysema. That's kind of that emphysema path, uh, pathophysiology showing up again. When you destroy the alveolar walls, you're going to have loss of elastic tissue and loss of the lung parenchyma, and this leads to more downstream effects. On one end, when you destroy your elastic tissue, destroy your lung parenchyma, you're going to create a pulmonary shunt, and that leads to decreased blood volume in the pulmonary capillaries. This leads to an increased number of alveoli that are ventilated but not perfused. Um, this is because you've kind of destroyed um, the, the, uh, the, the, the lung tissue, you've created a shunt, and there's less blood volume going to the pulmonary capillaries. So you're not perfusing your lungs, but you're ventilating your lungs. This leads to a VQ mismatch. You're going to have decreased um, transport of carbon dioxide. The lungs aren't going to be able to transport the gases as well, so decreased DLCO, but an increased mismatch of ventilation perfusion, an increased VQ mismatch. In addition, when you break your lung tissue, when you lose your lung parenchyma, you're going to have enlargement of your air spaces. This results in decreased elastic recoil and increased lung compliance. So essentially, when you take a deep breath in, your normal healthy lungs are going to kind of retract elastically. They'll come back to their normal state. So you really only have to do work to inhale. You have normal elastic recoil. When you destroy those air spaces, when you lose that lung parenchyma, you'll lose that elastic recoil. So when you take, when a person with COPD takes a deep breath in, they won't have that like retraction. They, their, their lungs won't come back to their normal state automatically. So um, they'll have low elastic recoil and increased lung compliance. This leads to a decrease in tethering of the small airways, which can lead to expiratory airway collapse. So essentially, when they're expiring, when they're trying to blow their air out, their airways are going to like kind of fall in on themselves, and air is going to get trapped inside their lungs. This, as I said, leads to air trapping and hyperinflation of the lungs. And when you have hyperinflation of the lungs, you have decreased ventilation and increased dead space in the lungs. Increased death space in the lungs also contributes to this VQ mismatch. <clears throat> so there's kind of two processes through which you have increased 
ventilation perfusion mismatch. And the ventilation perfusion mismatch is essentially what leads to your hypoxia, your low oxygen in the blood, and your hypercapnia, your high carbon dioxide in the blood. Remember that respiration, the point of respiration is to take in oxygen and to remove carbon dioxide. And when that fails, you'll have low oxygen and high carbon dioxide. This manifests as symptoms like dyspnea, shortness of breath, tachycardia, high heart rate, and cyanosis, or maybe a blue discoloration around the lips or on the skin of somebody with COPD. So that's a lot of pathophysiology, but it's worth knowing how this tissue destruction, the protease, the elastase activity, destroys the alveolar walls, causes this loss of lung parenchyma, and eventually leads to a VQ mismatch that manifests as hypoxia, hypercapnia, dyspnea, tachycardia, and cyanosis. One other manifestation from this pathway, the expiratory airway collapse that I mentioned. These people are trying to expire their air and their airways are kind of falling in on themselves, trapping the air in their lungs. One way that people have found to get around this and their body kind of subconsciously does this when they're struggling to breathe is that they purse their lips when they breathe. Uh, when they do this, they're essentially increasing their luminal airway pressure, and this helps them maintain an open airway. What they're doing here is instead of blowing all their air out at once, they're blowing out their air with pursed lips, which kind of inflates your lungs as if they're a balloon. And when you keep that, like you're essentially creating back pressure back into your lungs while you're breathing out, and that keeps their airways open so that their airways don't collapse and they're able to get more of their breath out. So this pursed lip breathing is something that you see in COPD as well. Now, all of these manifestations that I've talked about so far are kind of presenting symptoms of COPD. I'll next talk about the manifestations that you see in later stages of the disease. And we've already started to see this pink puffer and blue bloater manifestation as well. So we'll see that more and then I'll kind of give some summarizing thoughts on that at the end. So another manifestation that comes out of this pathophysiology, this decreased elastic recoil and increased lung compliance is use of accessory muscles while breathing. So as I mentioned, in normal healthy lungs, like myself for instance, when I take a deep breath in, I'm doing all the work by expanding my chest cavity. When I expire, I do less work. My lungs are elastic and they kind of return to their normal state, to their normal smaller state, kind of a balloon deflating when you let go of the neck of the balloon. That's what normal lungs do. But in COPD, they've lost their elastic recoil. They have increased lung compliance. So their lungs don't return to that normal state like healthy lungs do. This means that patients with COPD have to use accessory muscles to blow air out of their lungs. They're using these accessory muscles to increase ventilation, to increase the amount of air that they can get out. And then again, they have to use their muscles to breathe in just like we all do. So this tripoding, this use of accessory muscles is a, is a manifestation of, of COPD. This is extra work. It, it takes effort to do this compared to somebody with normal lungs. I myself with my normal lungs, I take a deep breath in and it's a little bit of work, but then the elastic recoil does the expiration. If I had to do work both in and out, and if I had um, airway collapse that made that work even harder, then it's gonna be extra work. And when you're doing that extra work, you can burn calories, you can essentially have muscle wasting, weight loss, and cachexia from doing all of that accessory muscle work in breathing. Another manifestation, this time from the air trapping and hyperinflation of the lungs, is that these people tend to have a larger chest. Not only do they have larger lungs, but that, that growth in their lungs, that hyperinflation, is seen from the outside as well. So they might present with a barrel chest, for instance. This also manifests in their lung volumes. They have a higher total lung capacity and also a higher FRC as well. So their lung volumes, if you were ever to test that, um, they would also be high. In addition, they'll have a higher AP diameter. This is anterior posterior diameter. It's essentially the, um, the, the direct distance through your chest from the anterior side to the posterior side. That might be higher in somebody with COPD. And lastly, they'll have hyper resonance on auscultation. So if you're listening to somebody's lungs, you'll hear all of these things, um, but you might also hear hyper resonance in, um, in, in, in their lung auscultation as well. Lastly, let's talk about the manifestations that come from pulmonary hypertension. When you have pulmonary hypertension, you have high pressure in your pulmonary vessels. This can lead to blood backing up behind the pulmonary 
artery, which can go through the right heart and back up into the systemic circulation. This can lead to peripheral edema. It can also lead to jugular venous distension. Essentially work your way backwards through the circulatory system. So if the pulmonary artery pressure is high, the right heart pressure is going to be high, the systemic pressure is going to be high, such as your ankles, um, your jugular vein also goes down into your right heart. So pressure there is going to be high. You'll see distension. Your spleen and your um, liver both go to your um, right heart as well, so those can also swell up and you'll have hepatosplenomegaly as well. Pulmonary hypertension also, in severe cases, can lead to right ventricular hypertrophy over time, and both of these can contribute to core pulmonale, which is essentially right heart failure. Um, and that can also kind of exacerbate these symptoms as well, so it can just make the pulmonary edema and the jugular venous distension worse. So one last thing, cyanosis can cause clubbing of the digits as well. And at this point, I've described all of the features of advanced COPD. And it's worth thinking about these two phenotypes now, pink puffer and blue bloater. So these were classically thought of as two distinct phenotypes of people with COPD. And it turns out that usually patients aren't really one or the other. They're kind of a combination of both, but it's still helpful to think of both as like separate phenotypes. So think of your pink puffer as like that tall, skinny smoker with like a raspy voice. Um, he's like super skinny, maybe because he smokes all the time, but really because he has COPD and he's doing all this extra work to breathe. These people have, uh, they're skinny because they have weight loss cachexia from using all of their accessory muscles to breathe all the time. They have a really, really big chest from all that hyperinflation. So you'll see the barrel chest, you'll see the high AP diameter, they'll have hyperresonant lungs. They breathe kind of with their lips together in a pursed manner to prevent their, uh, to prevent their airways from collapsing. That's the skinny pink puffer. The blue bloater, on the other hand, is like a super overweight big guy, always coughing. So they have that chronic productive cough. They're super overweight. Maybe they're a little fat, but also they have a bunch of water retention, that peripheral edema, that hepatosplenomegaly. All of that's kind of weighing them down. They have heart failure, right heart failure, that's leading to this water kind of being stuck in their ankles and their legs. Um, and their jugular vein is super big with that too. So. Um, blue bloaters tend to be more hypoxic. They tend to have worse hypercapnia and hypoxia than the pink puffer. Blue bloater tends to be blue with the cyanosis as well because they are hypoxic. So you can, kind of, you can kind of think of those two pictures, pink puffer and blue bloater, but remember that in COPD, really, you'll have a combination of these symptoms, just like you have a combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis as well. Really, those are um, kind of one and the same, and they all go under this umbrella term. This has been a little long, but I hope this overview of COPD was helpful, and thank you for listening.